Unit 2. Exercise 2.01. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Ludcaster University French Department. I'm Graham Wayne, Professor of French Literature and History. I'm afraid you may have seen my photo on the notice board. I'll be speaking in English today. No doubt I'll be meeting most of you properly in next week's seminars, when we'll switch to French. I am also course director for first year students, so I will be your point of contact for any queries or problems you may have. You should have my contact details in the folders you received. If you haven't got one of the course introduction folders, let me know about this. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the department, the courses that are available, what we expect from you, and what you can expect from us. The French department has four professors who are British as well as two native speakers. It's one of the smaller departments at Ludcaster, but we reckon that with six teaching staff, it's one of the friendliest, if not the friendliest to study with. At the end of the corridor on the left, you'll see the door to the LRC, the Language Resource Centre. We hope you'll be spending a great deal of time there. There's satellite TV, with six French channels, TVs and DVD players, with a large range of French films, at least 400 of them, and more than 1,200 books, about half of which are novels, and most of the rest are politics and history. If you want to take a DVD home to watch, you have to leave a deposit of £30 with Sophie, the LRC receptionist. If you don't return the film within two weeks, you lose your deposit. I know £30 seems a lot, We aren't looking to make money out of you, it's just that it's often hard to replace them. There's no deposit for books, but if you fail to return them, you must pay for a replacement. We also have a range of French journals and magazines, and a photocopier. It's not free, but it's much better value than in the university library. Your seminars and lectures start on Monday morning. Yes, sorry. Eventually, you have to start partying. Most of the course units are compulsory units in the first year, but after the first semester, you can choose from four voluntary units. In fact, you have to choose two of those. To start with, in your first semester, we concentrate on your French language skills. All of you will do writing skills, speaking skills, and, everybody's favourite, advanced grammar. Don't forget the compulsory literature unit. The books are on sale in the bookshop downstairs. The library only has 10 copies of most of them. And there is also French history. I'll be taking both of those units, so I expect you all to become experts. In the second semester, you will continue with the language courses, but you have to choose to specialize in either French arts or French politics. If you're taking the latter, you will need to get good results in French history. Attendance of all seminars and lectures is compulsory. Professors take a register in seminars and there's a sign-up list at lectures. Don't forget that we're a small department, so we notice if you're missing. You will have six seminars and eight lectures a week. All lectures and seminars last one hour each, so you will have a lot of free time to study outside these teaching hours. If you miss more than three sessions, that's either seminars or lectures, without good reason, you'll receive a warning. If you do that again, a written warning will be issued. If it happens a third time, you might be asked to leave the course. Remember, if you're ill or can't make it to class for some other reason, give us a call. The number's in the folder. We are not a police organization, but we expect you to take your studies seriously and attend all classes, however appealing it is to stay in bed on a cold morning. Exercise 2.02 We haven't been to Greenbacks for ages. It's a bit pricey, but they have a decent choice, and we could do with a cup of coffee. Too right. It's been a long week. Their coffee isn't that great, but at least they've got comfortable chairs. What are you going to get, Nat? Hmm, 
I think I fancy a large latte. I usually order latte here. I thought you didn't like milky drinks. Why don't you have cappuccino? It's got lots of chocolate on top. Oh, go on then. A regular cappuccino, please. What are you having, Carlene? I love their iced coffee. It's got bits of ice cream in it. Iced coffee, please. It's freezing outside, and we came in here to get warm. And now you're going to get yourself an iced coffee. Have you gone totally mad? Probably. I suppose I should go for the black coffee. It would wake me up a bit too. Actually, on second thoughts, it's not such a bad idea, Carlene. Um, cancel my original order, please. I'll have an iced coffee too. Large. <laughs> What was that about going mad, Nat? Men are allowed to change their minds too, you know. Hey, what's that supposed to mean? Um. Well. Um. Hey, let's get something to eat. My treat. I know you like jam donuts. Oh, you are a charmer. The donuts do look really tasty. Yeah, I'll have a donut, please. Oh no, that Danish pastry instead. That's the last one. Ha ha! Too slow, Nat. Get the chocolate croissant. Or there's that chocolate bar. I know you love chocolate. You're a bit of a chocoholic, aren't you? Hmm. Chocolate sounds fabulous, but I'll give it a miss today. I'm going to go for the bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. BLT, please. Well, so much for the diet. We said we'd go on. All diets start tomorrow. Anyway, we've been snowed under with work, so we deserve a treat, don't we? Exercise two point o three. Hi there, nice shop. Don't I recognise you? Your face seems really familiar. I used to work at the entrance, selling tickets at the ski centre, and I did a bit of ski instructing too. Maybe I was your instructor. Hey, that's right. It wasn't me. You taught my two kids to snowboard. They loved it so much. They make me bring them back every year now. So now I know who to blame. I'm glad they liked it. It was a great job. Doing something you love and getting paid for it—it it was a bit of a dream. How come you gave it up? I twisted my knee, and I suppose it was time to get a bit more serious about a career. So I'm manager here now. I still ski a bit when there's time. Anyway, how can I help? I was wondering how much ski hire is nowadays. I've got some friends coming here next weekend. Oh, we hire skis out for twenty-six fifty a day. Twenty-six fifty—that's reasonable. How's the quality? Ah,、uh, they're nearly all pretty much top of the range. If you need gloves and a mask, that's a bit extra. It's thirty-six dollars a day, which is still pretty good. Thirty-six a day, including skis, right? Yeah, it's a good deal. Do we need to reserve? No, not in off-peak season. Cool. How about hiring a snowboard for a day? It's a bit pricier. Thirty-two dollars a day for a good board. Thirty-two. Wow. I remember when it was twenty-five dollars a day. Snowboarding's popular now. Everyone's doing it. It's taking over from skiing in some resorts. Come to think of it, how much are lessons? I presume you can get those here too. You bet. It's a hundred and twenty-five a day for one-on-one -on -one instruction, three hours in the morning and three in the afternoon. Personally, I'd recommend learning as a part of a group, though. It's more fun and it's quite a bit cheaper. It depends what you prefer. That's seventy-six dollars per person for the same number of hours as individual instruction. That's a good deal. Does that include equipment hire? Well, since you're our first customer of the season and you recognise me, we might just throw that in. Fantastic. We'll definitely see you next week. Oh, one more thing: is off-peak season still until the end of November? Yes, and then for the whole of March. Oh, hang on, no. The seasons have changed a bit. I can't believe I forgot. The centres closed from the beginning of April to the end of September. Off peaks from first October until tenth December, and then peak season is around Christmas and New Year. Post Christmas off peak season is also the whole of February and March. Yeah, so peak season is from the eleventh of December until. From the eleventh of December until the thirty first of January, lots of school groups in January, even though it's fifty percent more expensive than off peak season. So we're getting a good deal by turning up at the start of the season. Oh, definitely. It's a good idea, anyway. 
Word hasn't really got around that everything's up and running, and most people are at work, so you get the slopes pretty much to yourself. Exercise 2.04 Hey Karen, there's an excellent gig tonight. The bass men are playing at that nightclub, the Big Boogie. Let's ask Mark and Graham to come along. They're good dancers. I spoke to Mark earlier on today. He has to finish an essay tonight, so he won't be out. Graham's about to go away. He'll be off to do some bird watching. He said there are some peregrine falcons around, and he's got to get a glimpse of them. Are you serious? He's a bird watcher. That's a bit of a surprise. Takes all sorts. I tell you what, let's call a few people and see who wants to come along. Good idea. See you in half an hour. So, Karen, who did you call? Loads of people. Graham was just about to leave to go bird watching, but when I told him about the gig, he said he'd be there, so he's coming along. Cool. I called Tess, and Nancy was with her, having lunch. Tess is going to make it, although she might be a bit late. Nancy is a bit short of cash, or practically broke, as she said, so she's going to clean the refrigerator instead. I cannot imagine Nancy cleaning her refrigerator instead of going out to a gig. Hard times. She lost her part-time job a while ago. Yes, that's true. So, Tom, who did you get in touch with? I phoned Richard, and he's a yes, so that's great. Doesn't Richard live with Peter? Did you speak to Peter too? Richard will definitely not be partying the night away with Peter, because Peter's on holiday. On holiday? Has his course finished already? It hasn't, but his course tutors told him it was fine. Anyway, he does French, and he's on a cycling holiday there. Cleaning the fridge, cycling holiday? What will they think of next? Well, now that you mention it, Isabel can't come either. Isabel? Oh no, she loves going out. It must be pretty serious if Isabel can't make it. She must be at work then. Yep. She's working until four in the morning at McTucky's next to the club, so maybe we can visit her after the gig. Exercise 2.05 Hi everyone. Sorry to interrupt your work, everybody, but I've got an announcement about the company ball. Yeah, sorry, this'll just take a few minutes. I know I usually go on, but this really is just a quick one. There have been a couple of changes, notably in terms of the venue. The Shelleton Hotel is in a slightly awkward location for many of you, so the ball is now taking place at the Star Crown Hotel. Apologies to the three of you who live next to the Shelleton. We're lucky enough to have booked Jumping Jive. They're a great live band, so I expect to see you guys strut your funky stuff on the dance floor. Don't worry, I won't be dancing. It's an informal event and we want you to let your hair down, but no jeans, please. Dress code is formal. I'm sure you're going to look fantastic, which will be a first for some of you. Tickets are going on sale tomorrow and guess how much they cost? $40. That's what was originally decided, so we have now printed all the tickets with that price. We originally set a target of 100 guests. However, now that we've moved to the Star Crown, which has a larger ballroom, we're going to double that number. This is great news, and not only because there'll be a bigger party with a great atmosphere, but also because it means we can reduce the price of the tickets by $5 per ticket. Of course, if you want to give me the $5, I won't complain. Anyway, a few extra important details. The ballroom's on the third floor, not the fourth. We kick off at 7pm with cocktails and some nibbles. The ticket says clearly that we must finish at 1am. This would be true if we were at our original venue. However, the Star Crown has requested that we wind things down by 12, so it'll all be over by midnight. I have no idea where you lot will go after then. But if it's anything like last year, expect to be drinking and dancing until 8 in the morning. Oh, one last thing. Hang on, is he here? No, good. 
John Smith, the boss, is leaving the company. No, only joking. I couldn't imagine the place without him. It's his birthday on the day of the ball. Don't forget we'll be getting a cake for him. He's saying goodbye to his thirties, so it's the big four o for him. Exercise two point o six. Table filling. Intercity Flowers, how can I help? Hi, I'd like to send a dozen red roses to arrive tomorrow morning, please. Certainly, sir. I just need a few details to complete the order. What's your name, please? Brian Trelawney. That's B R I A N T R E L. Yep, T R E L A W N E Y. Brian Trelawney. Have you ordered with us before, Mr. Trelawney? Yes, I have. I've got a customer number, if that would help. It's I F five one two W J three. I F five one two W J three. Ah, yes. Can you just confirm your address, sir? Thirty one A Molefield Road, Bragton. Sorry, thirty one E or thirty one A? Thirty one A for Alpha. M O L E F I E L D. That's correct. We don't have a phone number for you on our database. Oh, my mobile number is o seven four one double six nine eight six one. O seven four one six six nine eight six one. Oh, that's double seven actually. Thanks. I thought it was a bit short. Thank you. Okay, that's in your email address, please. We'll send you an email confirming the order. Don't laugh. It's topgun at grab dot com. Is Top Gun one word, sir? Yes, that's T O P G U N at G R A B dot com. If nobody answers the door tomorrow, what shall we do, sir? There'll definitely be someone there. But just in case, sir, can we leave them at the front door, or with a neighbour, or next to the house? Okay, leave them with any neighbour. That'd be fine. Okay, sir. That's a dozen red roses for tomorrow to thirty-one A Molefield. That'll be forty-three fifty. The last time it was thirty-four fifty. That was a special promotion for Valentine's Day, sir. It's back to its normal price of forty-three fifty. Oh, I see. Fine. Now, if I can just take your credit card details, sir. Exercise two point o seven, table filling. Can I help you, sir? Yes, I've been a bit careless and left my driver's license on a train. Oh dear. Well, let's take some details and we'll see what we can do. What's your name, please? George Lazenby. That's L A Z E N B Y. Can I have your address, please, Mr. Lazenby? Yes, it's nine Grover Lane. That's G R O V E R. Is that the Grover Lane in Chavton? Yes, it is. Do you know it? It's next to the tennis centre, isn't it? By the entrance to the car park. That's it. Wow, British Rail does get everywhere. It's a nice area, Chavton. Anyway, back to the licence. Do you know the licence number? Yes, my wife had the number. Luckily, it's eight four nine eight nine seven one P Q. So it's eight four nine eight nine seven one P Q. I left it in a bag, a red plastic bag. Okay, that's helpful. The chances are it's been handed in at a station. Was there any shop name or other writing on the bag? Hmm, I can't remember. I just know it was a red plastic bag. Which train did you leave it on? I went from Chigley to Camberwick Green. What time did you get on the train? The same train as every day. I get the train at three forty-two and get off at about four twenty. Okay. Have you reported this to the police? Yes, I phoned them as soon as I realised I'd lost it, and they recommended I got in touch with you.
Exercise 2.08 Table Filling. So let's see what you've got here. One pair of trousers, two shirts, two jackets, and oh, here's another shirt. That'll be £22.50. No problem. That's fine. Can I have your name, please? Jeremy Paxman. That's Jeremy with a J. So, J E R E M Y P A C K. No, sorry, it's an X. So, A X M A N? That's right. My address is 42 Zinzan Street. Zinzan? Yes, it's Z I N Z A N. The postcode's R G 4 3 I J. R G 4 3 I J. Can I have a contact phone number just in case? 0734 852 88. 0734-85288. Oh, hang about. It's double two double eight. Sorry, I'm a bit of a form filler's nightmare. No problem at all. Your clothes will be ready for collection on, let's see, it's the 12th of March today. So, yes, on the 15th of March. The 15th? So that's next Tuesday? That's right. We'll give you a ring on Monday to remind you. Here's your receipt. Do I pay now or can I pay on Tuesday? Pay on collection. Great. Well, have a good weekend. You too, sir. Goodbye. Exercise 2.09 Table Filling. Hi, Bob. I'm not going to make it to the office today. We're stuck out here in a traffic jam and I'm going to miss the plane back. Oh, no. Still, it means I can eat the chocolate you left on your desk. Don't you dare! Anyway, I just wanted to call to let you know. Oh, Vic, there's one thing. Someone called about that meeting next month in Norway. Oh, is that Danielle something or other? Um, hang on, I'll just get the post it note. Um, Danielle's stool. Have you got a pen handy? I'll give you all the details and you can sort it out when you get to the airport. Yes, hang on, okay, got one. So it's Danielle S T O O L with an E after the L. That's right, S T O O L E. Is she a miss or a missus? She didn't say. I suppose that makes her a miss. Okay, did she give the address of the office? I said I'd stop by to see her. Yes, it's 763 Bath Avenue. 763 B A R Bath Avenue. Cool, that's fine. Well, she said you should email her the details of the conference stand. I've got the address. Okay, shoot. She's Danielle Storr. So it's std at transco.co.uk. std at transco.com. Oops. No, it's .co.uk. Phone number? I'll give her a call. 0340 647 She said, please don't call between 12 and 2. Exercise 2.10 Table Filling. Hi, this is a message for Sam Botterill of Credit Co. Financial Services. My name's Peter Sellers. That's S E L L E R S. And my application number is, uh, hang on, here it is G O 638710 N S. Just in case, my address is 5 Milligan Street. That's 5 M I D. Double L I G A N Street, and I'm applying for the Silver Standard Card, not the Gold Standard Card. I understand the Silver Standard Card has a credit limit of £3,500. I'd like to ask if my application has been approved. Please call me anytime from 7 am to 9 pm on this number 069 100 229. Thanks very much. Bye.
Exercise 2.11 Table Filling Hello there, everyone. Can you hear me at the back? Just joking. Actually, 24 students is a record for us, so I'm delighted you're taking an interest in my native tongue. Rather immodestly, we like to think that Czech Language 101 is the best taught course on campus, but that's probably what all the other departments think about their courses. Anyway, I'm extremely pleased to see you here, and I'm sure we'll get to know each other pretty well over the next nine months or three years if you really like it. Last year, three quarters of our first year students elected to continue studying the language, and we think that three out of every four students is a compliment to the friendliness of the Slav language department. I'm Professor Krasensky, and I teach all the language units in the Czech department, although Professor Belova will be returning next January. However, until then, your favourite Czech name will be mine, which is spelt as follows. K-R-A-S-E-N-S-K-Y If you spell Krasensky any other way, especially with an I at the end, you will not be doing very well on the course. Anyway, if you look out of this window, you'll see over there, next to the English Literature Building, a new building going up, the Centre for Modern European Languages, of which we shall occupy six rooms. However, until the Centre for Modern European Languages is ready, and because life is never simple, will be using the science building. Language seminars will be in the biology room from 9 to 10 on Mondays and Thursdays. That's 9 to 10 in the morning, ladies and gentlemen, so take it easy on Sunday and Wednesday evenings, please. The biology room is pretty easy to find, just ask at reception. Lectures, also by me, I'm afraid, will take place in the Physics Lecture Theatre on Wednesdays and Fridays, at the more civilised time of 5 to 6. That does not mean that we start at five minutes to six. We finish at six after an hour of fascinating intellectual stimulation. Fortunately, if you get thirsty in the physics lecture theatre, there's the Czech Beer Club on Fridays at seven. If you don't like Czech beer, then you should learn to. Two other important points. To get into the science building, you must prove that you're a student here, so bring your student identity card for all seminars and lectures. I would also like you to bring a good Czech dictionary. When I say dictionary, I mean a book, not a little computer programmed by someone in China or Malaysia, where they are experts in Czech, of course. I'm not against technology per se, but things that beep and whir and distract attention in class are not welcome in my sessions. Please do not use mobile phones or computers in lectures or seminars. If you're expecting an urgent call, Give the person the number of the reception desk, but make sure you switch off your mobiles and computers for all my seminars and lectures. Also, you may think your computer can translate everything, but your head, with a decent dictionary to help, is better and quicker. If your computers can do it already, then you wouldn't have universities, which would be a pity, because I rather like my job. Exercise 2.12 Table Filling Hi Joel, we've only got two hours to send the newspaper to the printers. Have you finished the story yet? The student pub survey is the lead story, so if it's not ready, I might have to murder you. Christine, I told you it'd be ready yesterday and sure enough, I've just finished it. I had to do some last minute research. You mean you got drunk last night at Dirty Dicks? Typical <sighs> man. Well, I had a couple of Molly O'Hollies too, and I'm nothing if not thorough. You've got to admire my scientific approach. Hmm. Anyway, I'm glad you finished it. Well done. What were the results? Bit of a surprise, actually. Although I did predict that male arts students mostly drink bitter at the Rutland. And that's true, according to the survey. Another good reason not to frequent that particular pub, then. What about the guys who study science? Do most of them go to the Rutland, too? I thought they would, but even a man with his finger on the pulse of university culture can be forgiven for the occasional error. They're bigger lager drinkers in the main, 
and their favourite haunt is the Temperance. Hmm, imagine a date with a physics major drinking lager in the smokiest pub in the world, the Temperance. No wonder most of them are single. Well, the women of academia don't seem to display any great taste in their selection of watering hole either. What do you think female art students said their favourite drink was? Gin and tonic? Wine? Um, yeah, red wine's what I normally have. Well, Sherlock, closer investigation has revealed that the tipple in question is Russian in origin, with a hefty kick, and it's called vodka. What's more, they like drinking it in an Irish establishment. Dirty dicks? Oh my goodness. Um, Molly O'Holly's is the place. Even worse. It's got the worst interior decor I've ever seen. Maybe drinking the vodka makes it look good. Now to the female students. The ladies of the laboratories are a bit more genteel. Gin and tonic at the Blue Anchor for them. The Blue Anchor's only 100 metres from the science building, so that makes sense. And the G&T is pretty strong there. The barmen are good looking too. Are you suggesting that the guys who study science are a bit geeky and might be a, a touch on the ugly side? You do engineering. You tell me. Moving on quickly, the postgrads we spoke to were almost unanimous in their choice. Must be the old age pensioner's favourite on Smithson's Road. Hey, the 56 isn't bad, and it's much cheaper than most other places. Actually, the 56 is a pretty cool place for a couple of drinks, and they have a great bar. I bet the men drink whiskey. That's what you'd think. In fact, most of the postgraduate male students drive to university, so they generally drink orange juice. We only spoke to three postgraduate students who aren't men, and they all live locally, and they're all Scottish. They drink whiskey. So the postgrad men sit there in the 56 with an OJ while their female colleagues enjoy a couple of shots of whiskey? Nice. Maybe I'll enrol in a postgraduate course. At least I'll avoid all the drunken lads. Exercise 2.13, Table Filling Financial news now, and a quick look at one of the big players on the stock market, Megacorp, the media and electrical appliance giant. Not much was happening with Megacorp shares around Christmas, when they were priced around $3.50, but news of the potential resignation of Jan Eubank, their hugely successful first female CEO, rocked confidence on the financial markets. The shares ended the year on just $1.38, and the average price for December was at exactly a dollar more than the minimum price, with 3.6 million shares traded in that month. January saw a positive avalanche of trading, and after the previous month's mean figure of 2.38, shares started selling like hotcakes, and almost 20 million shares were bought and sold. If another half a million had changed hands on 31st January, it would have been 20 million in that one month but by then the CEO had finally confirmed that she would be staying, and a couple of board members resigned shortly afterwards. The average share price for January was 2.16. All things considered, it was a respectable figure, just 0.22 lower than the December average. Whilst their rival, Trend Media Incorporated, held its February share price at an average of 350, Megacorp achieved the comeback of the year so far, ending with a February average of 3.51, and that difference between the two companies may be only one cent, but it's a huge psychological boost to Megacorp, especially after investors fought tooth and nail to buy a total of 10.2 million of its shares in February. 10.2 million being just 0.1 short of a February record. Who knows what ups and downs March will bring. Back to the studio. Exercise 2.14. Table filling. Hey, Nigel, have you seen this article about those paintings? The five greatest modern paintings in the world? Are you thinking of going to see them all? Well, if you're thinking of buying me a round-the-world ticket, taking me 
in Germany, China, Australia, America and the UK, then yes, I will. Oh yeah, I was just popping down to the travel agents to pick it up. You should be so lucky. Still, it would be fun to see them all. I really like Pistachio's work, and Afternoon Tea really is a classic painting. We could go to see it, you know. It's only down the road in London. I'll tell you what. If you can guess the year it was painted, I'll give you the train ticket to London. Cool. Hmm. End of the 19th century. Um, 1899? Oh, so close. Two years out. 1901? Wrong again. Good guess, though. It was a hundred years before the Van Bogh painting, which I hate. It's just a drawing of a cigarette. Well, what do you expect? It is called cigarette. Anyway, if you get yourself over to Beijing, you can see it. Shanghai, actually. All right, so Beijing got the Olympics and Shanghai gets a ciggy. Good deal. Anyway, I'm not too partial to Van Bok's stuff. I do like Whistleton, though, and I love the colours in electricity. I'm with you there. It's a bit of a miracle how the painting still looks fresh today. Those sparks seem to jump out at you, even though it was painted about two years before the end of the 19th century. You know, we could make it to Berlin, even if it were just to see a piece of canvas from 1898 called Electricity. Well, we could go clubbing too. Hold on a minute. If we're really going to pull our fingers out and genuinely make an effort to see a modern classic, we should fly over to Melbourne to see Roland's post office. Sad story, that. He painted it in 1917 in the war. He died the week after he finished the painting. Still, we could go over there for the Melbourne Cup. I love horse racing. You're all hot. So we've just about got enough cash to cover next month's rent, and we're on about flying down under. Anyway, it's 1916. Oh, hang about. No, it's 1917. I stand corrected by myself. When he painted it, it was such a different style of painting, such a revolutionary portrayal of everyday life. I suppose it defined a new movement. Well, that's more than can be said for Pincher. Washington's never really tickled my fancy, and I wouldn't spend a fortune to fly there to see a picture of an old woman stealing a bag of peas from a supermarket. What a load of rubbish. 1986 wasn't a vintage year for art. That depends. Calling it shoplifter wasn't very imaginative. But in 1986, he did paint one picture every week, including shoplifter. That is amazingly prolific. What about if a shoplifter walked into the Washington Gallery and stole shoplifter? It'd be great publicity. Yeah, and some sort of justice. Exercise 2.15. Table filling. Hi, can you explain the different types of train tickets to me? It's a little bit confusing. It's not as clear as it might be. We have five main ticket types, and the simplest is the standard single. You just turn up, buy the ticket, and go. Can I book those in advance? If you'll bear with me, we'll come to that. That standard return ticket is similar to the standard single, except, of course, it's for return journeys. There are two conditions. You have to make both trips on the same day, and the second one is that you must travel after a quarter to ten in the morning. I see. What if I need to return but have to travel before 9.45? Then you need two singles. This all sounds like a bit of a minefield. I know, but if you book in advance, things are better. The Super Advance single gives you a 45% discount if you book a fortnight in advance. 45% off. That's pretty good. Yes, it used to be only 15%. If you want an even bigger discount, go for an Astra return, which you have to reserve four weeks before your outward journey. It's a 60% discount compared to standard prices, and you can return any day within six months of your outward journey. That's a really good deal. So if I want to book, say, seven weeks in advance, that would get me an Astra return? Yes, as long as you book 28 days or more before your trip. What's the Roma? Is that something like Interrail? Yes, it's £247 for a month, and you can use the entire network for that period. So I can travel anywhere, anytime on the network for a month? As long as there's a train going. Oh, and it's standard class, not first class.
Exercise 2.16. Table filling. So let's get started. Just to reiterate, this is just an informal chat about how things are going with French lessons here at the school. From what you've said, there's not much to discuss in terms of the syllabus or equipment, and things are basically going really well. That's right. I really enjoy teaching here. That's good news. I notice in some classes you're even ahead of schedule, which is practically unheard of. You've mentioned a few underperforming students, though. Well, there's only one student with major problems, but I'd like to just flag a few of them and maybe mention something to the parents. A stitch in time saves nine, sort of thing. Okay, who's first? I'll take them in class order. 2B, Brian Jones. He's a strange sort of guy, not bad at all, and his results put him up there in the top 10% of the class. His reading and listening skills are superb. So, what's the problem with Brian? He really has trouble paying attention. When we're in the middle of a role play, his mind will just wander and he's in a world of his own. It's not particularly disruptive, it's just that it happens pretty often. Let's just make a note about concentration levels. If he can't pay attention in other classes too, it could be serious. Now on to 4C. It's a great class. We're having some really good discussions. However, I think Lydia Robinson is finding things tricky. Lydia? Is that Robert's sister? They really look alike. That's Lydia with a Y. So it's L-Y-D-I-A. OK, so what's up with Lydia? She's not a bad student, really, but she's very bookish. You know, her spelling and grammar are excellent, but she really doesn't understand much when I speak French and her listening is poor. She just needs to open up more and start communicating. So she needs to be putting her spelling and grammar to good use? You could say that. OK, now on to class uh, 5E. Jemima Rag is doing well in her written work and her vocabulary is probably the best in class. Yes, I've taught 5E. Jemima seemed OK. It's when she opens her mouth that things go wrong. Her pronunciation is just awful. Maybe we could ask her parents to make sure that she does more listening and maybe get a private tutor. I really think that would help her pronunciation. OK, who's the last one? I think I can guess. John Sun in 6B. No, 6A. I wrote that wrong. Yes, he switched from 6B to 6A. Well, he's a real challenge. Don't get me wrong, he has 100% attendance and he really tries hard, so his effort is exemplary. But what lets him down is his basic grammar. He really hasn't grasped it. So he gives it his all, but he's not going to get any further with his grammar the way it is. That's about the long and the short of it. Every piece of written work is on time, but it's virtually incomprehensible because of his lack of basic grammar. Exercise 2.17. Table filling. The nation-state of Slovenia in southern Europe is bounded on the east by Hungary and Croatia, on the south by Croatia, and on the west by Italy. Its northern immediate neighbour is Austria. Slovenia is a tiny country with a surface area of approximately 20,000 square kilometres, which is about 7,800 square miles. Its capital city is Ljubljana, and the other major city is Maribor. The country has a complex and fascinating history and a rich cultural history, little known outside the country's borders. The region was settled in the 6th century AD by the Slovenes, from whom the country takes its name. Nowadays, far from being the economic backwater that its relative anonymity suggests, Slovenia is making great strides in terms of development, thanks to targeted investment in technology infrastructure. With its 2 million citizens enjoying some of the highest rates of mobile phone ownership and internet connection access in Central Europe. One of the country's major industries is software development, although two more traditional sectors employ more people textiles and steel. Slovenia is a very young country, having proclaimed independence from Yugoslavia only very recently in June 1991. Almost 13 years later, Slovenia became a member of the European Union on 1st May 2004, along with several other Central and Eastern European states.
Exercise 2.18 Table Filling Following the passing of the British Library Act by Parliament in 1972, the British Library came into operation with effect from the 1st of July 1973. Subsequently, two other major institutions were integrated into the British Library, expanding the depth and breadth of its collections, the India Office Library and Records in 1982 and the British Institute of Recorded Sound in 1983. The British Library has a number of constituent parts. The major sections of the organisation known as the British Library are the Library of the British Museum, Patent Office Library, National Central Library and the British Library Document Supply Centre. The Department of Printed Books of the British Museum was founded in the same year of the foundation of the British Museum in 1753. The Library has the privilege of legal deposit which means that a copy of a large proportion of all printed material in the UK goes to the British Library. These include not only books, journals and magazines, but also newspapers, maps and printed music. The British Museum's domed reading room is well known in intellectual circles and was designed in the 1850s at the instigation of Sir Anthony Panisi, then Chief Librarian. Originally, the reading room was open to the general public, but due to overcrowding, a pass was required for admission. In addition to Vladimir Lenin, other famous readers in this exclusive place of study included Karl Marx and the writers Charles Dickens, George Bernard Shaw and Virginia Woolf. The British Library Document Supply Centre currently administers a stock of over 260,000 journal titles, over 3 million books, almost 500,000 conference proceedings and nearly 5 million scientific reports. Its 20,000 customers from all over the world make about 4 million requests every year. Thanks to the internet, customers can now access information and services online as document supply is achieved via electronic means. The British Library's website is www.bl.uk. Exercise 2.19 Table Filling One of the leading scriptwriters, stand-up comedians and filmmakers of his era, Woody Allen was born in Allen Stewart, Konigsberg on 1st of December 1935. Born and brought up in Brooklyn and New York, he loved reading comic books and watching movies and he proved to be a natural writer. At school he was noted for his extraordinarily high IQ, but school is said to have held little interest for him. When he was 15, he took up the clarinet and became an accomplished player, particularly of jazz music. Allen began selling jokes to newspaper columnists and in the early 1960s began appearing in comedy clubs, telling his own jokes, and is now known as one of the greatest stand-up comedians ever. In the mid-60s, Allen moved into the world of filmmaking, at first as a writer and actor. What's New, Pussycat? came out in 1965. Woody Allen proved himself a prolific writer, and as well as movie script writer, he had two hit theatre shows on Broadway. He became a film director in the late 60s and produced some hugely successful film comedies, notably Sleeper, a comedy set in the future, Bananas, a comedy set in a banana republic, and Love and Death, his classic spoof of Tolstoy's War and Peace. In 1977, his film Annie Hall was a huge success, and won him praise from audiences and critics alike, and it won three Oscars for Director, Screenplay and Best Picture. Exercise 2.20 Table Filling 
Splendor Hotel reception. How can I help? Hello. I'd like to book a room for tomorrow, please. For three days. That's fine, sir. We have plenty of free rooms. Would you like a single, twin or double room? A double room, please. And it must be non-smoking. No problem, sir. All rooms include breakfast here. English continental or fresh fruit? Oh, the English breakfast is too greasy for me. Continental, please. Oh, no. Fresh fruit, please. Very good, sir. Can I take your name? John Smith. Oh, and can I just check that you have tennis courts? Indeed, sir. They're just next to the beach volleyball courts. Not really a beach volleyball fan, but have you got squash courts? Yes, sir. We have two. Excellent. I take it I can hire rackets and stuff? That's right, sir. Am I right in thinking you have about 12 table tennis tables, too? Aren't they on the top floor with a great view of the sailing ships? Sadly not, sir. We've got four tables in the sports centre on the fifth floor. Naturally, we have bats and balls for hire. Fabulous. I'm not that bothered about watching sailors having fun. What time will you be arriving tomorrow, sir? I think my flight gets in around 3.40 in the afternoon. So I reckon I'll be there at quarter past five, as long as the traffic's OK. You should allow two hours, sir. It's the rush hour. Ah, OK. So 5.40 it is. What time is checkout? I'll be leaving on Wednesday, and the flight's kind of late. What time is your flight on Wednesday, sir? Oh, I think it's 6.30 to LA, so I should probably leave the hotel at 3.30, shouldn't I? You might need to leave earlier, sir. You normally have to check in at the airport two hours in advance, and the traffic jams are really dreadful nowadays. I'd recommend leaving here at 2.45. OK, I will. Can I get a late checkout? That's fine, sir. I'll put in a late room checkout at 2.30. That's wonderful. Can I just check if you've got broadband internet connections in the rooms now? Indeed we do, sir. It's a very quick connection, too. This is all good news. One more thing. I need to hold a meeting on Tuesday afternoon for 12 people. Can I book that now? Of course, sir. I can book a meeting room for you. It's perfect for 12 people. Will you need a projector or a screen or a whiteboard? Uh, no, thanks. It's not that kind of meeting. Well, the London room is booked for you. Will that be all, sir? Yes, that's great. I'll see you soon. I have to run to catch my plane. Have a good flight, Mr Smith. We'll see you soon. Great. Bye.